it's been shown that the human brain, a part of the human brain is, is dedicated to nothing else but appreciating beauty. It's part wow. of what makes humans unique. Wow. And even then, you can differentiate between musical beauty and visual beauty, smell beauty. And that's a great challenge to evolution. Why, why should we have this part of the brain dedicated to appreciating beauty? Hello, everyone. Welcome to Creation.Live. In each episode of this show, ICR's scientists gather with subject matter experts, apologists, and other special guests to discuss pressing issues, whether that be ICR's current research, something new that's come to light in the scientific community, or something else entirely that ultimately impacts how science points to our Creator, the Lord Jesus Christ. We hope that these conversations are encouraging and enlightening in an increasingly chaotic world. I'm your host, Trey, and I have with me today uh, my co-host, Lauren. Hello. And we have with us today on the science side of things, uh, Dr. Stuart Burgess. Hello. And uh, ICR president, Dr. Randy Galuzzo. Hello. Uh, thank you all so much for being here. Um, I'm excited to get to jump into this. Yeah, uh, this is a good one. So before we get started, uh, most people know who you are at this point, so you're fine. Uh, but Dr. Burgess, uh, can you tell us a little bit about who you are, your expertise, what you've studied, all that? Um, I'm from the United Kingdom. Uh, I'm a professor of engineering design at Bristol University. I've also taught at Cambridge University. Um, most of what I've been teaching is designing mechanisms or designing motor cars, that also involves designing a bit of beauty because aesthetics come into motor car design. I've also worked for the European Space Agency designing uh, robots for spacecraft. Wow. Um, but probably the most fun uh, thing I've done is work for the British Olympic cycling team, Ooh. helping them to beat the US cycling team in the <laughs> Olympics. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> well, uh, we won't judge so <laughs> or really take cool, too, much of, too much of offense. Wow, that's uh, quite a, a list of... Uh, accolades. So thank you so much for being here. I'm, uh, I look forward to this topic. I think that this is a unique topic. And uh, for our viewers and listeners, we're going to be talking about beauty. Of course, you probably already read the title of the episode. Um, beauty is one of those things that it's, uh, it's subjective to a lot of people, but there's also some objectivity to it. Uh, it's something that we can kind of recognize. We know it when we see we know it. When we see yeah. it. But uh, it's kind of hard to like pinpoint, I would say, like what really makes, unless you study beauty, uh, what really makes something beautiful. Uh, but we'll start at the top and we can just say that like we know that beauty exists. It's very clear uh, and particularly within the world uh, creation, we can see that there is astounding beauty. And so I want to ask. Uh, mountains or beaches, if you had to pick <laughs> one place to hang out and just experience the beauty of God's creation, would it be at the top of a mountain or on a beach? Um, I think for me, probably a beach. I, I love a sunset. Um, I love the way that even though air is transparent, God is such a brilliant designer that he can put color mm-hmm. into air, a blue sky or a lovely sunset. And for God to create something that is both transparent but also can be made to be beautiful, that's a, a brilliant design feature. So that's probably my favorite. Awesome. Dr. Great. G? Oh, this is hands down mountain, without a doubt. Uh, you know I live in the mountains. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> not go anymore. Back. Yeah, not anymore. <laughs> yeah, Texas. And right here it's not. But um, I love the Black Hills. I love uh, all the, I love the Four Seasons. I love all of those things. I love another thing which we're not thinking of in terms of beauty and that is the smells, mm. the smells. So when you get out there and you have that pine forest and all of those other things and the sounds, the birds and the wind and the rustling, I just like all of that combination rolling together. Sure, good. sure. Do I get to answer too? Yes. Okay, good. I love both, but I think beach edges out mountains for me actually, because just like for you, sounds are very inclusive in that beauty experience. For me, it's very much about feel, feeling as well. So just feeling the sand, um, feeling the breeze, feeling the sun, and also smelling um, just the surf and seeing the ocean just go on seemingly forever in front of you. And oh, I just love it. Plus, that's where I usually go with my family. So yeah, that definitely edges out too. Well, I'll even things out. I'm a mountain guy. I prefer the mountains. Uh, I 
am not a huge, huge fan of the ocean because, in my opinion, it's scary. So uh, <laughs> you've watched Jaws too many yeah, times. No, it's more like uh, I don't know. Just the vast openness. It it it's beautiful, but it also freaks me out a little bit. So. I'll go climb a mountain instead uh, and enjoy that kind of weather and, and that kind of beauty. Uh, so I just think that it's interesting that God has provided lots of different kinds of beauty for us to enjoy. Um, so like I said earlier, beauty is kind of subjective, but there are <clears throat> objective uh, ideas of beauty. Uh, we can see when something is not beautiful uh, or when something is, I guess, ugly or gross or something like that. Um, why do you think that is? What would you say is like um, the prerequisite for objective beauty? Well, when I'm teaching my students, because I teach aesthetics for motor car design, and I've had some students say, but it's all subjective. And I say to my students, yeah, we may not give the same value to a beautiful site, but there's definitely objectivity in beauty. If you go for a job at General Motors and you say you don't believe in beauty, you won't get the job because mm. beauty sells motor cars and it gives profit. Um, and with any kind of beauty, there are always objective factors. I mean, if you take musical beauty, music is very mathematical. Mm -hmm. Melodies, uh, harmony, uh, key signature, time signature. There's a lot. Of, you can actually define the beauty partly by math. So. Mm -hmm. Whilst there's always a subjective side, we, we don't agree exactly, there's definitely objectivity in, in, in beauty. Okay. Dr. G, what do you think? Oh, without a doubt, it's objective. And there's been multiple studies, um, people looking at, I, I hate to say this, but it's different faces of human beings, and they, they, they judge and they rank this beautiful face, this, not, this is not or less. And one of the major factors is symmetry mm -hmm. on, on a face. You have your eyes, your ears line up with the corners of your mouth, and then your mouth should be parallel with, with your brow line and things like that. And you can get this type of really nice symmetry that people, when they rank something as beautiful, it is more symmetric than, than things that aren't ranked as beautiful. There's like a, a lack of symmetry. And, and we've all seen people who don't have a symmetric face mm -hmm. and things like that. So uh, there is an objectivity to it as well. And using words like symmetry, I mean that is that is mathematic and it and it's mm -hmm. very at its very core. So that's interesting. So. so does beauty seem to offer any kind of benefit practically, like specifically survival benefit? We're kind of looking into different approaches to why beauty exists as far as evolutionary perspective, creationist perspective. Does beauty offer any benefits or is it a sign of certain benefits like symmetry might mean that something works better? What are y'all's thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it's really hard for the evolutionist to explain beauty. Um, if you read what Charles Darwin said, uh, there, there were a lot of references to his problem with beauty. He said when he thought of peacock feathers, it made him feel sick because he couldn't explain it. Mm. And there was another one where he was asked about flowering plants and he said they were an abominable mystery. <laughs> so beauty was a real problem to him and it continues to be a big problem. In the UK and Europe, one of the most senior evolutionists was John Maynard Smith. He, he died a few years ago. But he said in one of his publications, beauty is the for him the biggest challenge to evolution. He just mm. could not explain it. Um, yeah, so I think it's, it's a big problem to evolution. Mm -hmm. I was going to say flowering plants for me are also abominable, but it's because I can't keep them alive in the <laughs> Texas heat uh, and they keep dying. So, uh, Dr. G, what about you? Yes, it is, it is a problem because it's one of those features which is, is really not necessary uh, for survival. You can make up a story and evolutionists do I should say evolutionists. The ev <laughs> yes, the that sounds so much better. I know. The, well, anyway, the evolutionists, <laughs> they kind of make, a, and, and particularly evolutionary psychologists, yeah. they make up stories in abundance mm -hmm. to try to explain human beauty or other things. And, and they also try to explain it by comparing us to animals, why animals do this and why we would, why we would favor those things. But it's not just beauty that we have that you would say this is, this is really not necessary. Why do humans have so much brain power? 
which is an super and abundance, more than what we really need to function. And other things like that, you, you say, well, this is far in excess of what is m- the minimum necessary in order to perform the function. Mm-hmm. And in, core, in an evolutionary theory, when you have trade-offs between energy expenditure and the investment and other things, you should hit an optimization where it's just the minimum energy that you need to expend to get the minimum amount of what you need to do. Efficiency. To, in mm-hmm. terms of hitting an efficiency and brain power, other things, beauty, they greatly exceed that. And so it's it's very hard to explain along those lines. And I don't know whether you're going to have any question on evolutionary psychology of like how do they try to bail themselves out of this or whatever. But, of course, it's, it's there and... How did it get here? You can't ignore it. Right. Uh, If if you can clearly see it, you can't ignore it. Well, to me, I would say when I see objective beauty, when I see something, I'm like, oh, that's beautiful. And I can like process that in my brain. I mean, I don't know what all is going on inside my brain when I'm seeing beauty. I'm I'm not a neurologist or uh, it's an incredibly complex organ, but like I can see it and I'm like, hey, this is this is good. Um, this inspires me, Uh, this gives me hope, this gives me peace a lot of times. I think that's one of the reasons why I like mountains over over beaches is because mountains to me are peaceful and beaches to me are kind of anxiety inducing. So, uh, but when I see those things, it's like, okay, this gives me something to think on and to ruminate on and to be at peace with and to me, it indicates that there is something behind that beauty. Uh, Another mind that has given me this so that I can enjoy it, uh, at least um, from my perspective. And I know that here we're all, you know, we're all believers here and it's like, we know that God gave this to us, but why? Um, Why does that exist? It's part of being made in the image of God. And it's interesting how you were talking about your brain processes beauty because it's been shown that the human brain, a part of the human brain is is dedicated to nothing else but appreciating beauty. It's part wow. of what makes humans unique. Wow. And even then you can differentiate between musical beauty and visual beauty, smell beauty. And that's a great challenge to evolution. Why, why should we have this part of the brain dedicated to appreciating beauty? That's why I think it's such a great um, evidence. But following on from that, I'd raise the point that there are two types of beauty. You know, when I'm teaching students, um, there's like a functional beauty. So if you're designing a car, if it has an aerodynamic shape, it's likely to look quite smooth and beautiful. But engineers add beauty, add embellishments to the cars, perhaps the way the grill is or some special shape. You also see it in classical architecture in, in columns. A plain column can look beautiful, but it's often embellished with rims and uh, embellishments like flower shapes. And it's that added beauty, which is a very powerful evidence of intelligent design, because when you look at the ornate features of the Vatican building or Buckingham Palace gate, you know that it was designed because when you look at the order of those features and they don't even have a mechanical function, Mm -hmm. you know that must be uh, the, the the work of a designer who's mm-hmm. put beauty in. And within creation, we see some of this added beauty, this embellishment beauty. That's why Darwin was was made sick by the peacock feather, because with a peacock feather, it's more than functional beauty. There's this added embellishment. beauty for It's a real example of beauty for beauty's sake. And that's what is the real, that's really where the evolutionist gets really stuck when you're talking about added beauty. Because it's not just, I mean, we think about, okay, the peacock has the feathers to attract the mate, but then we also as humans, a completely different being entirely also find those feathers beautiful. And I I think, I think that that's an interesting, uh, it's almost like they're there for us also. Yeah. There's a huge amount of information behind the beauty of a peacock feather. And it's been shown that the female peafowl can't even recognize some of the features. So the idea that the female is choosing them, that's been proved to be not mm. not possible. It's just beyond what's required. Wow. Well, and it's so interesting that animals have beauty. Animals often do things that are beautiful but have a function. But as far as what they deliberately produce intentionally on their own, 
they only create functional things to my understanding. They don't create just intentionally beautiful things. It's focused on the function. And yet humans do have this ability to create a building with these mm -hmm. columns that have these beautiful intricate designs on them that don't actually accomplish a purpose other than beauty. So it really sets us apart from the animals in that way. And that's, that's very interesting to me. That's, that's an interesting thought. Well, if we're, if we're just looking at, at beauty for, for beauty's sake, that's, those, those are the words you used. And I think that that's, that's a really concise way of putting it. So beauty for beauty's sake as humans who can comprehend and conceive of beauty, uh, put it into music, put it into artwork, put it into cars, et cetera, uh, whatever we're doing, um, what then do you imagine it's, purpose is, I mean, not just why we can comprehend it because yes, we're made in the image of God. Uh, we're, we think along those same lines. Uh, what is the purpose then? Is it just for enjoyment? Uh, is it for general satisfaction? Uh, could it be maybe that it's just a pointing finger to, Hey, it's clear that there is design because of it. I, I don't know. What, what are, what are y'all's thoughts on that? I think it's a, a mixture of things. It's definitely uh, creation reflecting the glory of God. When you look at the beauty of flowers, you, you, it's a reflection of God's glory. God also wants us to enjoy creation, and God in, himself enjoys creation and the beauty of creation. Uh, I think there's some important uh, Bible scriptures to consider. In Genesis 2 verse 9, I think, it says, God created trees pleasant to the sight. Mm -hmm. showing that he did it deliberately to make mm -hmm. them beautiful. In Job 26, 13, it says God adorned the heavens with the stars, deliberately making them beautiful. In Matthew 6, God so clothed the flowers of the field to make them beautiful. So scripture is teaching us that God enjoyed making a beautiful creation and he wants us to have that enjoyment of that beautiful creation. But I think at another level, it's pointing forward to the beauty of heaven. Mm -hmm. In Psalm 50 verse 2, it talks of the perfection of beauty in heaven. I think that's a really key verse teaching us that heaven is the very definition of beauty. It won't just be beautiful, it's absolutely perfect beauty. And so on earth, we have a few glimpses of this beauty to come. And even the beauty of God's people, one of my favorite verses in the Bible is from Psalm 149. God will beautify the humble with salvation. He clothes us with the righteousness of Christ if we have faith in him. And that gives us a kind of beauty. So beauty is a big, it's a big spiritual topic. Psalm 27 talks of the beauty of the Lord. So beauty is a big feature of the kingdom of heaven. So it makes sense that God would want us to begin to see glimpses of that in creation. Oh, that's beautiful. I love that. No, no pun intended, but yeah. that is just a beautiful <laughs> thought. It really is. Yeah. And I'm curious, Dr. G, if you had any other thoughts on the purpose of beauty, feel free to jump in. But I'm also curious your thoughts on, is there an evolutionary understanding of beauty that actually makes sense? Um, and just kind of giving their side of it, but feel free to comment first on the purpose as well. Well, sure. Um, let me, let me jump on with what Dr. Burgess said. Um, all of those things are a revelation of the character of of God and in all of creation is revealing different aspects of this. So the fact that we can see beauty, we know that and that he appreciates beauty, but that he is in some ways beautiful. Mm -hmm. And in the mm -hmm. same way it's revealing, there's always contrasts um, between something that is beautiful and something that isn't beautiful, light with darkness and and beauty with things that aren't beautiful. But when we when we have the concept of like the peacock flower that that's beautiful, then he extends that other things are beautiful that you may not think. He says, "How beautiful are the feet of them that bring good news?" So mm -hmm. you normally don't always look at feet and say, "Oh, this is beautiful." Particularly if you're a podiatrist and you're taking care <laughs> of foot disorders or things like that. But he's telling you that there's something else. I want this is this is how I see this. You see this peacock feather, this is how I see someone who brings mm -hmm. the gospel to that. And then he said, he, he, was, he speaks even of, of these holy women, that they have an inward beauty. He says, let their, let their beauty not be mm -hmm. this outward beauty. He doesn't say there is an outward beauty. He says, but there's a beauty that extends deeper than that. And mm -hmm. I see that beauty um, that they would have as well. 
So regardless of how the world would see them in terms of this outward beauty, which we still appreciate, he's saying, when I see them, it's as if I am seeing this other stuff in terms of their character. So that's a, that's a real intangible thing, which he's telling us is there, but you would never really understand what it is until you saw a peacock feather, you saw a glorious sunset in the mountains, or something along those lines. As well. And by the way, uh, on TV, whenever there's a glorious sunset around here on the Weather Channel, on the weather, people are sending in mm-hmm. loads mm-hmm. and loads of pictures Good of point. these things. So there's, there is they a... Know. They know. People yeah. know what it is. They're sending it in. Oh, this was a glorious sunset. Boom, boom, boom. Here come the pictures. Mm-hmm. So everybody, everybody sees this. Now, in terms of the follow-up question, is there a plausible evolutionary explanation. When I, and so when you say plausible, I'm going to say one that's testable, one that we can actually measure in some ways. And the answer is no. There, you, there isn't an evolutionary explanation because for one, you can't go back in time and repeat any of this. So what you're stuck with are narratives. You're stuck with these stories that they come up with. Oh, you know, I look at, you know, of course, it, it's, it's how do men view women. Oh, I see this, and it's and it's supposedly sending me indicators of fertility, as if that's all I want to do is just have loads and loads of offspring. Well, which according is part of the to the evolution. evolutionary theory, that is that the is purpose, of course right? yeah. that's that's what that's what the purpose of 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 men is according mm-hmm. to evolutionary theory, which mm-hmm. is also just another made up story as right. well. And so, for according to their story, I'm supposedly seeing indicators indicators of fertility and virility and all this other kind of stuff. But that's also not subject. That's totally subjective as well. It's not testable in any way. So I don't believe in terms of something that we could actually measure and to um, validate their story. There's nothing really out there. Okay. Because okay. they do surveys and such, <laughs> and people can describe why they think something is beautiful. Right. But that might not be actually why they view it as beautiful. That's or how not we empirical, got beauty. that's not repeatable, right. that's not testable. Exactly. Absolutely. Why do we have why do we have it? That, you know, that's the evolutionary explanation. Why do creatures have this? Yeah. And of course, we there's loads of creatures that we subjectively say, ooh, that's kind of ugly. You know, that's <laughs> ooh, that's gross. That's gross. But they seem to mate and reproduce. <laughs> and, they're, beautiful. Yeah, they're doing all right. Know, they're doing all right. Yeah. yeah. Can I just give uh, one example, which is, I think, a really big challenge sure. to evolution? Because uh, I've had some debates and discussions with, with, with the evolutionists, not just about the peacock feather, but I think the biggest problem, I, I would say, is, is bird song. There are some mm. birds like robins, nightingales, blackbirds, certainly in Europe. I don't know if it's the same here, but they sing with incredible musicality that has astonished scientists. They sing songs with a time signature, a key signature, melodic phrases, harmony. In fact, For those who don't know music, that is very complicated stuff. That yeah, doesn't in, just happen. In fact, yeah. you need a degree in music to appreciate. Sometimes it's similar to the music of J.S. Bach. They, they've compared it and they've just wow. been absolutely astonished. The reason this is a really big problem is because birds don't just sing to attract a mate. In the case of a robin, they mainly sing to protect their territory. That is a huge problem because there are books on evolution saying the reason that musicality has developed so much is because when a robin sings to protect his territory, he is frightening his competition by showing them how good his musicality is. So when he transposes from a major key to a minor key, his competitor across the fence thinks, wow, that's so beautiful. I'm really frightened of this guy. I'm going to leave him there. It just doesn't, it's such a ridiculous yeah. theory that the more beautiful, the more frightening it is. But That's that is literally. Yeah. Now people say, okay, but why then does he sing to protect his territory? Birds are not stupid. They wouldn't just sing for the sake of singing. So God has given them a reason to sing so we can appreciate the song. So he says to the robin, you sing to protect your territory, but actually the reason you're singing is to give joy to people and to give joy to me. Some birds have very simple calls to protect their territory, but God in his wisdom has done that. But that, that is such a problem. If I can just mention uh, one other thing on, on bird song. Sure. At Cambridge University, the top university in the world, uh, <laughs> with the most Nobel Prize winners, 
Um, <laughs> just, th- just there was a, hug. <laughs> there, that's a subjective there, there test. There was a <laughs> professor there called Professor Thorpe. He died something like 10 years ago. He was the world expert in birdsong. Now, he believed in evolution, but he said this in his books. When I consider birdsong, which I've been studying all my life, evolution does not make sense. The purity of birdsong. I cannot begin to imagine how selective pressures of evolution could produce the musicality of birdsong. And it was as if he was saying, I only believe in evolution because it seems to work in every other area. But in my area, I do not have a clue how evolution could produce the beauty of birdsong. The problem is, in every other area, professors are saying exactly the same thing. <laughs> right. I cannot see how it works in they this area. We need to area. talk to each other more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We actually just talked about that with like every scientist is so focused on their little thing and they're like, well, the other scientists have it figured out, right? Uh, it's kind don't. of crazy how it works that way. But they don't. Yeah. So do you think creationists sometimes get a little bit too lost in the technical side of the sciences? I say technical as far as what most people view as more easily viewable, measure, measurable. Do you think creationists need to look more into beauty and that side of science? What are y'all's thoughts on that? Well, I think we do. Um, and at ICR, we're, we're trying to advance this whole idea of engineered biology. And you would mm-hmm. think, well, engineered biology and beauty are, are almost mutually exclusive because engineering is functional and optimization, efficiency, and all those other kinds of things. But it's, it's really not. And as Dr. Burgess has already mentioned, we embellish things, we build beauty in to make it look nice, we adorn other things like that. And in terms of engineering, I, I would I venture to say on a car. So Dr. Burgess has mentioned a car and, and he mentioned you know, General Motors. But let's just take, we'll, we'll throw him a bone and we'll say a Jaguar. Uh, a Jaguar <laughs> is, a, is, a, is a nice looking car. But the beauty on the Jaguar also serves multiple functions. Mm -hmm. And on engineered things, there's nothing that really serves a single function in many, many times. And so the, 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 the skin on the car, if we'll just call it the skin, it has multiple functions on it, just like your skin does. Your skin has multiple functions, one of which is, is beauty. And I would say the skin and your subcutaneous fat around that the Lord has given us to fill things out and to move mm-hmm. things around. All of those have multiple functions. The fat is a function, and we think, oh, in terms of energy storage or blah, 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 blah. But in many ways, it's it adds beauty to things. It adds form. Mm-hmm. And when people have surgeries that take off part of their face or things like that, they will graft fat from other parts of your body mm-hmm. to fill in the contours, to give it the lines that it is needed. So from an engineering perspective, Beauty is just one of the multi-functions that everything in a design thing has. In fact, I would mm-hmm. say on a human body, you could it's not even a function. It's not two functions. For everything I can think of, I can mm-hmm. think of three, four, or more functions mm-hmm. for what they do. So engineering and beauty really go hand in hand. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Uh, when I'm teaching my students, I say, you know, if you're a good student you will be able to make something beautiful and functional. At the same time, it's really difficult, but if you're good, you can do it. And also you can have more functions. The moment I'm actually doing research on multifunctionality in biology because it's so more advanced than human engineering. And as as Randy was speaking, it made me think of probably the most, my favorite part of the human body for beauty is the iris in the eye. If you look at the iris, whether it's a brown eye, blue eye, If you look very closely, you see those little lines going towards the pupils. Now, those lines are lots and lots of tiny, tiny muscles, dozens of muscles that can open and close the pupil. It's a masterpiece of engineering. It's like a camera shutter. And yet, at the same time, God makes the eye so beautiful. And we often focus on the beauty, but it's actually an incredible shutter mechanism at the same time. So it's that combination. When When you see the combination of function and beauty... It actually makes you more appreciative of what God has designed. Wow. Yeah, that's that's an interesting facet of it. It's it's not just functional. It is beautiful also. And beauty is also a part of that function, like because we need that. Uh, we need that as humans, as 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 made in the image of God. And you were mentioning the car. I just 
this thought came to mind and I'm going to try to put it out there without making a fool of myself. Uh, <laughs> when you look at a, a beetle, uh, you know that it was made by VW. Uh, if you see a Tesla, you can, you know, it's a Tesla just from looking at it. And, and I'm starting to maybe understand some of these pieces. Like, uh, we see the beauty in the world and it just shows God made it like it's, it's his, like his fingerprint, signature. his signature. Like when you look at a, when you look at a Picasso, uh, you know, it's Picasso who, who painted that. Uh, and so you look at everything in creation and you know that like, Hey, a human didn't make this because we're not smart enough. We're not talented enough. We haven't developed any technology to kind of reach that point yet. Uh, or we will never be able to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's here. And because of what it is, I can look at it and know that God made this. So I, I just, I think it's like, it's just a very tell, it's like his signature. Uh, it's his, his trademark. And beauty is important to God. And you referenced several verses in scripture that talk about beauty. A lot of people think of scripture as telling the story of history, telling the gospel, telling us how to live and please the Lord and love other Which people. Which it is those and things. And it is all of those <laughs> things. But it also is so much more, and it gives us a glimpse into all of the different aspects of God, including beauty. What are some of your favorite passages in scripture that touch on this issue of beauty, whether it's in a direct way or just something that is beautiful that's within the scripture? What are some of y'all's favorites? Maybe some that you've already mentioned, you can expound a little on that or some others yeah. as well. I, I mean, for me, Matthew 6, uh, for God so clothed the flowers of the field. People often miss that verse. Of course, it's talking about we shouldn't worry about food and clothing, and it's good to focus on that. But it's very fascinating to think yeah, Jesus was saying Solomon in all his glory, he had incredible beauty. Mm -hmm. And yet that doesn't match the beauty of flowers. And it was God who clothed the flowers. And to me, that means God did it deliberately. It, it's not just that flowers happen to be beautiful, but it was a very deliberate act of God. And there are so many types of flowers and were so much more important mm -hmm. than a flower. So it shows God's care and attention in detail, which is why we need not worry so it's good to think of the detail of what that's what that's saying mm -hmm. but also it shows how much god cares for man if he cares that much for plants and flowers he cares mm -hmm. for us so that would probably be my my favorite uh passage of scripture on beauty i love that yeah yeah well i'm going to take a little different tack when i went to moody i was an engineering student and i had a fascination with as i already mentioned the symmetry Mm -hmm. and the, the correspondence between things. And I, w I, had, I wasn't raised in a Christian home, so I wasn't a Bible reader for many years before that. And as I, I started through the Pentateuch, and I, I already had a little understanding of the Lord Jesus and what he did and what it was all about. And I started going through and seeing the clothing on the priests, the mm -hmm. functions of the priests, the details of what they wore, the uh, the parts of the tabernacle, even the colors of the skins on the tabernacle, the features and the furniture in the tabernacle, I started to see a symmetry that was just so beautiful to see. Oh, mm. this, is, this is so precise, not just close, but precise. The, the priest wears on his shoulders and his head holiness to the Lord. He carries the names of Israel on his heart, and he puts the names on his shoulders, and he bears their burdens. And and I started to see all of this between something that was written literally thousands of years before the Lord was even born. Mm -hmm. And to me, that was not just astounding. There was a sense that it was just really beautiful to see how everything was just fitting together. So it may be subjective to me, but I found that beautiful. Can I just add a tiny yeah. thing to this? In Exodus 35, it says that God gave the gift of design to the artists who who built the tabernacle. So it's a gift that people can, that the God can give to people. Mm -hmm. And also in Genesis uh, 4, it talks of the gift of music to one of the first families. So right at the beginning of creation, God gave the gift of music and beauty to a family. Uh, so it's, a, it's something we can pray to God for, the, the, the gift. And mm -hmm. it is a gift. I mean, there are so many things in this universe that really draw our attention or capture our imaginations. 
But beauty, it captures almost every part of who we are, including our emotions. Like several times, even in this conversation, I've just teared up just with the thought of the intense beauty. And beauty is one of the only things for me, beauty is one of the only things that really just captures me like that. And I don't even know where to go with that. It just, it, <laughs> this whole conversation is just so encouraging. And we just get to see little glimpses of who God is and how beautiful he is and Oh, I just I love the examples that you guys gave and just the different forms of beauty. Um, like we've talked about a lot of different forms of beauty, some of them in what God created that we can see or um, hear or smell or taste, others in things that we can observe that he has produced, like information in a beautiful, symmetrical way in the poetry in scripture and in the different construction of the temple. And he's just so creative in his beauty and like you said, it is a gift, and we are so grateful for that. He didn't have to do that. He could have made everything purely functional if he wanted to, and it would have worked just fine. But he chose yeah. to do that. I love that, not just to bring glory to himself, but also as a gift to us. And that's that's just a beautiful thought. I know I keep saying that, but I just, oh, this topic's one of my favorites. Yeah, I think beauty will be a huge topic in heaven. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a big topic there. Mm -hmm. For yeah. sure. I was going to say, I think that we can even... Um, like you had mentioned, like the feet that bring the gospel are beautiful. There's like this, uh, there's very clearly an objective beauty in like things that we see uh, and smell and hear and all that. Uh, but there's another kind of beauty. So I'm a movie watcher. I watch a lot of movies and my wife makes fun of me a little bit because I get like weepy uh, with like, heroism, I didn't uh, know that. with, uh, sacrifice. <laughs> and those are beautiful things mm -hmm. too. Right. Now they're not mm -hmm. like physically beautiful, but like the mm. thought process behind it, the, the love is also so like, I think that beauty even goes beyond, uh, what we can see or like the physical aspects of it. And right. I think that also speaks to part of who God is. I mean, he gave the ultimate sacrifice, right? And that's beautiful. Yeah. Because without it, we would be dead. So, We want to study the things that point towards God and that show us who God is. As we've discussed at length here, beauty is one of those things. So I would love to hear from both of y'all on this. How should Christians approach beauty, specifically in areas of apologetics or science or other areas that you can think of that Christians are studying? How should a believer approach beauty? Uh, yeah, I think believers should approach it in a very positive way. Uh, so like I tried to give talks on beauty. In fact, I do have a lecture, an hour's lecture on beauty. And sometimes I won't mention evolution once in, in one hour. So it's not all about being defensive about mm. evolution, but mm. it's good to present uh, and enjoy presenting evidence of beauty to show how it reflects God's glory. Uh, it's like an example of Romans one twenty, Since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen and and the heavens declare the glory of God. So, yeah, it's it can be a very positive thing, showing how beauty reflects the glory of the Creator. Absolutely. I think I think we that's a great question. How should we approach? So it says in Psalms, "Make His praise glorious." So we are, and in order to make something glorious, it takes work, mm -hmm. it takes effort, it, it just doesn't roll off. It takes practice, and I think he's telling us, I'm worth it, and um, mm -hmm. I'm worth your time, I'm worth your effort, I'm worth, I'm worth the extra effort mm -hmm. that it's going to take to make this just more than just functional, but glorious in order to do that. And so, in, in a way, Christians, I'm not going to say have an obligation, but they have like an impetus to do more than the bare minimum mm -hmm. in almost anything. We can set a table or we can, you know, and at times that's all you need it to be is functional for breakfast for yourself. But there's other times when you have guests, there's other times when you're doing things, are they worth it? Is your is your wife worth it to bring flowers? Is Are they worth it? And so in many ways, when you say, how do we approach beauty? There's a part where we, where we want to be practical and pragmatic. And I almost border on that side myself. But then there's other times where you say, well, this person is, is really worth it and I'm going to make something beautiful for them. And the, they perceive and they sense 
the effort that you put into it and what you're, the message you're sending to them by doing that. Because God put the effort in, in creating this universe. I was just, I was just thinking of, it's interesting. We, we've so far talked a lot about beauty here on earth and, and in biological things and in plants and in peacocks and, uh, but we're just here on the earth and there's an entire universe out there of which we're the only sentient creatures. We're the only ones who can appreciate that. Uh, and it's vast, it's huge and it's beautiful. Like I see pictures of nebula and, uh, uh, I don't know, just some of the planets that we see and you know, it's, it's not perfect because our technology isn't that great out there yet, but like God made all that, all the stars. And it's just like, Hey guys, I'm here. I'm showing you just how awesome I am, you know? And, and that's just kind of mind blowing to me, but I don't know. I, I just, sometimes when I think about space, I feel really small and then I'm like, but you know, God put it there for a reason to right, show us right. who he is. Just thinking about stars that made me think of Psalm 147. Uh, God created the vast universe. And of course in that Psalm, it, it says praise is beautiful. Mm. And maybe the most beautiful thing we can do is to praise God, sing praises to God with fellow believers in church. So absolutely. That, that's just is, is yet another example of, of beauty in the Bible and the, and the purpose of beauty. Mm -hmm. wow. Absolutely. Well, I just, uh, I want to thank you all for talking about this very unique topic. I think it's something that uh, is maybe overlooked a lot when it comes to science or even just theology. You know, you go to church and you learn how to be a better Christian or uh you know, that's not what it's supposed to be. You're supposed to go to church and like fellowship, but oftentimes like that's how it comes across as like, mm -hmm. oh, here's what you're supposed to do to be a good Christian. And it's like, well, no, like let's experience God. And part of that is just uh, experiencing the beauty of creation, uh, getting to know him because it's a part of his personality. God is a God of order, a God mm -hmm. of beauty. Uh, and he gave us that because he loves us. So, um, do you have any closing thoughts before we uh, bring this podcast to a close? Uh, there's, I could share with you one slightly tricky question someone asked me after talking about beauty. Sure. And that is, what was the beauty of the original creation mm. like? Now, that's something that we'll never know for sure. But I think it's possible that every creature had wonderful coloring. Maybe even almost every creature could sing at the beginning of creation. And one of the reasons for saying that is that now we see the predator-prey relationship following the curse on creation and animals need to be camouflaged. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting is if you go to areas where, like a dense forest or a coral reef, where there's a lot of protection, the animals are still brightly colored, like the birds of paradise or the coral reed uh, mm -hmm. fish. Mm -hmm. So it's only areas where animals are not protected that they've lost their coloring. And to me, that's a little indication that in the original creation, there was spectacular color and music in many, many places. So here I think we're only seeing a, a glimpse of the beauty that was in the original creation, which makes me think in heaven, the beauty will be back to, to full power yeah. again. Mm. That's exciting. What a thought. Yeah. Wow. 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 Well, as I guess we're wrapping up and we want to always point people to the Lord Jesus Christ mm -hmm. in, in every way we want him, we want them to trust him as Lord and Savior of their life and, and enjoy whatever that glorious future is going to be for us as well. And a lot of times people, they they won't come to Christ or they don't even consider God because they think he's a killjoy. Mm -hmm. They think he's an ogre. They think he's he, all he has is bad stuff out for us. But the reality is, it's just as this conversation shows, he's not. He He's good and he wants good things for us and he wants to give us good things. We're the ones who bring the mar. We're the ones who bring the the problem. We're the ones who sin. We're yeah. the ones who sin. But the mere the real fact that there is this beauty that he enjoys and he wants us to enjoy is a real indicator that he is a good heavenly father and he has a glorious son that he has given for us. Yeah. And I bring it back a little bit to that sacrifice. That sacrifice on the cross 
uh, was the most beautiful, um, and that's why that's why we can enjoy it today without just being overwhelmed with how uh, depraved humanity is, how our own depravity, our own sinful nature. So, um, yes. I just, it's overwhelming a little bit, but uh, thank you all so much for being here. Uh, we appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Burgess. Uh, it's been fascinating talking with you. Um, I think that this whole conversation will really be a, something that people can use in the future. Um, I know it will be for me. This yeah. has been hugely encouraging for me personally. I'm really it's, grateful to hear y'all's mm. thoughts on these I things. Land on the, I, la I land on the pragmatism side. And so I can be like, oh, well, beauty isn't necessary. You know, it, but it is. It is 100% necessary and it reveals who God is. So thank you all. Welcome. Thank you. And thank you to all of our listeners and viewers for joining us for this episode of creation.live. Uh, we encourage you to like, subscribe, share, uh, if you have any friends who are artists or musicians or uh, they build cars or design cars, whatever, what, whatever beauty they're involved in, uh, share it with them. And uh, we just really want to get this truth out that God is just a magnificent designer uh, and that he is beautiful. Uh, so we encourage you to share and we'll see you next time on creation.live. We want to say a huge thank you to our members and patrons. If you'd like to see your name here and unlock perks like early access to our podcasts, members only polls and live streams, behind the scenes footage or exclusive video content, links are in the description below.